1947, Rank Pictures released one of the most unusual and visually stunning British films ever made, Black Narcissus. Black Narcissus was created by one of the greatest and most distinctive partnerships in film history. Director Michael Powell and Hungarian-born screenwriter Emmerich Pressburger. It was a very good partnership because you had two opposites and, and in, that, in those opposites you had an empathy which was extraordinary. It's a paradox, isn't it? That you had... Uh, you had Michael Powell, who was the fireworks, you know, going mad and doing this, and doing that, and let's do this, yes, come on, you know, all sort of thing. And on the other hand, you had Emmerich, who was a very intelligent man, very wise, and a deep thinker, and a brilliant writer, of course. And so he was able to keep Michael a certain amount of, 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 of in check, as it were. And it was a wonderful combination. As well as filling his cast and crew with enthusiasm, Michael Powell could also be a daunting figure to work with. Noreen Ackland, who worked as an assistant editor on both Black Narcissus and their previous film, A Matter of Life and Death, can clearly recall their first meeting. The first day in the cutting room, Mickey was there. He just sat and stared at me like this. While I was filing trims, and he sat like that the Oh, for ages, just looking, everything I did. Really intimidating. Emmerich got the ideas of the scripts and he wrote them with, with Mickey, but mainly it's him, it's all his dialogue. He was a very quiet man, um, very thoughtful man. And um, I think he felt a little bit that Mickey take, took all the limelight. With the support of J. Arthur Rank, The Archers, Powell and Pressburger's production company, became synonymous with some of the most daring and imaginative films of the era. Before The Archers came to make Black Narcissus, they'd, they'd really risen to an extraordinary kind of position in British cinema because they'd, they'd worked their way uh, very rapidly through a series of increasingly ambitious films. Nice. through the life and death of Colonel Blimp, huge, sprawling, technicolour epic. And then they'd made, in 1946, A Matter of Life and Death, which was the most ambitious film of their career to date. And it was chosen for the first Royal Command film performance. And it, it showed filmmakers who felt they could tackle absolutely anything. So they were at the height of their, you know, their, their ambition as filmmakers. What would they do next, was the big question. How could they possibly top it? Black Narcissus was adapted from the acclaimed novel by Ruma Godden, an author fascinated with India and the difficulty Western visitors found in adjusting to a very different way of life. Oh, sister, the schoolroom is overflowing with children. We've nothing unpacked yet. No one understands the language. There are too many of them anyway, and they smell. And in Black Narcissus, what she does is to create a melodrama, a melodrama of the high mountains the Himalayas, um, disorienting a group of expatriate um, nuns, sisters, who have come to establish a new outpost of their order to help the local people. But in fact, it turns out the local people are perhaps a little more knowing <laughs> in many ways, or certainly their, their leaders are, than the nuns realize. And so this, this little group find themselves in very testing situation. <laughs> There's nobody in the dispensary. None of the children have come. There are no gardeners. And she has gone. So has the young general. There isn't a servant in the place. We're all alone. There's no one in the house. Throughout their partnership, Powell and Pressburger often cast actors who had proved successful in previous Archer's productions. Deborah Carr had played three separate roles opposite Roger Livesey in The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp. For Black Narcissus, she would take on the role of Sister Cloder, a young English nun given the task of establishing a new mission. Sister Cloda, we may proceed with our plans at Mopu. It will be called St. Faith. St. Faith? And you have been appointed to take charge of St. Faith. 
I, Reverend Mother? You. You will be the youngest Sister Superior in our order. She had already been spotted by many people as a rising star, and the real problem for, for Powell and Pressburger was how to hang on to her. They'd lost her for an earlier film, A Canterbury Tale, where they'd wanted to play her. Uh, they'd lost her. There wasn't really a major part in the matter of life and death for her, because for that they needed an American actress. So it was a real achievement, since her star was rising in Hollywood, to actually get her for... Uh, black Narcissus. Mother, are you sorry that I have been appointed to take charge of St. Faith? Yes. I don't think you're ready for it. And I think you'll be lonely. Deborah, of course, was a f very fine actress. And by the way, when we started, I suggested to Michael Powell that we shouldn't have any, uh, none should never put any lipstick on. He agreed completely. And the joke was, they had no lipstick, no, they put no lipstick on. But when we saw the first couple of days' work, we realised that the natural lip colour with the Technicolor system that in those days looked like lipstick. So we had to put a kind of flesh, flesh uh, makeup, a uh, slight flesh makeup over the lips to, to make them less red anyway. I think you'd better go back to your room. Bye, sister. I hope your patient does well. Who is she? It sounded like Samuel, but it couldn't be, could it? Oh, Samuel. She's a good old soul. One of my best workers. I'm very much obliged to you. Thank you. And I remember Deborah did say to me, because I was the one that was always sort of having bits of rows, and she said, you know, when Mickey tells you to do this, just say, what a wonderful idea, and do exactly what you were going to do, which was her way of it. Because she never, she never had rows. Everything was smooth and quiet and very ladylike with her. She was marvellous. Lovely actress to work with. Kathleen Byron was another young actress returning to the Archer's Fold. After smaller roles in The Silver Fleet and A Matter of Life and Death, she would give one of the most intense performances of her career as the volatile Sister Ruth. Well, I had heard that it was very sought after, and um, I didn't think for one minute that I would get it. I, I read the book and I thought it was a very interesting story. And uh, I was... Uh, Mickey had gone away on, on a holiday and I suddenly got a telegram from him saying, um, you've got the part of Sister Ruth. The trouble is, you'll never have another one as good. <laughs> so he's probably right. Black Narcissus offered a mixture of English reserve, exotic scenery, and a strong undercurrent of repressed passion. Perfect subject matter for the Archers. It's a film about being out of place, I think. And one of the most interesting moments is where we see the old... We see the palace, really, for the first time. And we see the old retainer who dances around this sort of slightly mad woman who, you know, fills us in on its history, how it had been a, uh, effectively a harem, a palace, and is now about to become a, another, a place of women again, but a rather different kind of women. And this is a sense of a space that's haunted by ghosts, by the ghosts of its past. As well as the familiar faces on the screen, the film also reunited many of the key members of the Archer's production team. Among them were art director Alfred Junger, camera operator Christopher Chalice, and director of photography Jack Cardiff. It was a, a piece of cake for a cameraman. I mean, it was absolutely heaven sent because one had the, uh, the fact, the story point of view was that this place was so beautiful that it destroyed the intentions of the, of the order and that they, they went to this place hoping to start a, a convent and a school and uh, in these fantastic surroundings. And it was so beautiful that they all, everything went wrong. And the cabbage patch? Foxgloves. And the runner beans? Honeysuckle. And the onions? Tulips. And the potatoes? All flowers. But what on earth came over you? The woman who was supposed to plant vegetables uh, she, she was planting flowers instead, you know, and they had no vegetables, all those sort of things. And Deborah Kerr was thinking uh, of her, the boyfriend that left her, and they all went crazy. Chloe, 
Don't you sometimes itch to get away? No, I don't want to go away. I want to stay here like this for the rest of my life. For many people, the idea of doing black narcissus was a bit surprising. It was even more surprising when it was discovered that they weren't going to kind of go on location. After the uh, Battle of Life and Death, Michael asked me to operate on their next film, which was Black Narcissus, which was a, a story uh, of nuns set in the Himalayas. And um, I thought there would be a nice location to India or something like that. And I said, well, where are we going, Mickey? We all thought at the time that we were going to go to India. And the first meeting we had, the production meeting, Michael Powell said briskly, we are not going to India. There was a sort of gasp, with, my God. Well, how are we going to get these, these in a realistic atmosphere? A triumph of cinematography and art direction, Black Narcissus saw the sound stages and lots at Pinewood Studios transformed into a sumptuous but run-down palace in the Himalayan mountains. When the film was finished, not one frame had been shot outside the British Isles. For the exteriors, with all the Himalayas, and you see all the mountains in the background, well, they were all uh, plaster cutouts but on a sort of quarter scale, but all built to tie in with the actual shot. Uh, they weren't upright. They were laid back so that at a certain angle, at a certain time of the day in the sun, they looked right, and you could only shoot them at that time. But I think it was, um, it was brilliant, and, and the overall look of the picture was just wonderful. There was one location that was uh, just a few miles away towards Brighton. So we went there for one day to do some long shots of ponies going by and things like that. Otherwise, it was uh, all done in the studios. After the film, we did have uh, a few letters from people in India saying they recognised these places, you know. <laughs> so we felt we'd succeeded in that. The other member of the team that we shouldn't forget is Brian Easdale, who, the, the composer, who was brought in at this point because he'd spent some time in India, knew something about Indian music, and what he creates in Black Narcissus is an extraordinary score. It's a real symphonic 1940s movie score, but at the same time it has wonderful inflections that sort of add to the sense of, of atmosphere and um, strangeness. And you must be the Sister Superior. On their arrival at the mission, Sister Cloda and the Order receive a frosty reception from the surly land agent, Mr. Dean, played by David Farrer. I'm the General's agent. He welcomes you to Mopu. Understood you wanted to see me? We want to talk to you on business. I didn't suppose you want to talk to me on anything else. Yes, I thought he was terribly good in that, wasn't he? He was very, very good. I, I remember saying to him once, I. I don't really know how to say these lines. He said, oh, I never have that problem. He said, there's only one way to say the line, and that's the way I say it. <laughs> he was, he'd done so many films. He'd done hundreds of films, hadn't he? And, and uh, to him, it was just sort of like getting up and having your breakfast. He <laughs> just went on and did it. David Ferrer was a very, very good actor to work with, very calm. And we had Sabu, who was great fun. And we had... Um, Flora Robson, another fine actress. So it all worked very well. We were very lucky, I think. Maybe Mickey uh, picked actors that he got on with and who were good, and I think, you know, they were, they were all very good. I mean, uh, Gene Simmons, who was very young, was, was excellent. Um, and Deborah was, of course, always nice. I mean, she's a nice person to work with. And it all went sort of jolly well from that point of view. Esmond Knight was wonderful, of course. I have invited some ladies to stay here at the House of Women. Ladies? Oh, that will be like old times. It will not be in the least like old times. They are not that kind of lady at all. Then they won't be any fun. Esmond Knight, who played the role of the old general, had been seriously injured while serving in the Navy during the Second World War, and as a result was almost blind. Esmond told me that the first thing he remembered uh, in hospital when, it, when he was ashore and everything, he was blind and badly injured and everything, and there was a phone call and it was Mickey. 
And Mickey always called him Old Horse. He said, how are you, Old Horse? And <laughs> Esmond said, well, not too good. You know, I can't see. He says, never mind. He said, I've got a picture waiting for you as soon as you're well enough. Sausages. They will eat sausages. Europeans eat sausages wherever they go. He was of loyal... I'm talking about Michael now. He was of loyal friend, but it all went unsung because he didn't publicise it. I've never heard him talk. They say he speaks perfect English. Several other European languages, too. One of the big hit films of the 1930s had been Lost Horizon, based on a novel about the idea of Westerners going to Tibet, the Himalayas, and kind of, you know, discovering a sort of spiritual awakening. Well, actually, what happens to the nuns of Black Narcissus is that they discover almost the opposite. Their faith is called into question, and they begin to wonder what, what they're about and what they're there for. Well, I really don't know what to do. What would Christ have done? The presence of the earthy Mr. Dean soon causes tension within the order. Sister Ruth becomes besotted with him and sees in Sister Cloda a potential rival for his affections. I think you have let yourself fall into thinking too much of Mr. Dean. Sister, don't you realize what you're doing? What you're running the risk of losing in yourself? Sister, you must, I must make you see before it is too late. All the same, I've noticed you're very pleased to see him yourself. Michael Powell always had a clear idea of what he wanted from his cast and crew. But Kathleen Byron had her own ideas about the character of Sister Ruth. You can't order me about. You have nothing to do with me anymore. On one occasion, it was after I'd got my lipstick on and my red dress, and I was going to Mr Dean's bungalow, the man I loved and the man I thought loved me, and... Uh, Mickey was telling me how he wanted it done. What I wanted to do, and I'm sure I'm right, was that when she got to this bungalow, she suddenly thought she was in the place of the man who loved her, and she loved him, and that he wasn't there. So she goes about picking everything up with great reverence and, and loving everything in, in this bungalow. Whereas Mickey wanted me to pick things up and throw them all over the place, you know, go quite mad. I thought this was ridiculous and quite embarrassing. So I was looking the other way and he said, you're not even looking at me. I said, no, you embarrass me. <laughs> so he got up and walked off the set. And Jack jumped up and said, oh, Mickey, are you ready? What do you want? He said, she'll tell you. So um, Jack came to me and said, what do you want then? I said, well, I want to do it this way and that way. So he sort of said, all right. and. Um, called Mickey back and said, do you want to see what we've arranged? He said, no, shoot it. So we did it and we shot it. And he said, it wasn't what I wanted, but it's very good, print it. <laughs> we went on as if nothing had happened. The tension on set between Kathleen Byron and Michael Powell was also heightened by their off-screen relationship. He was a person that had an enormous amount of crushes on different women. He always did. and. Um, I, I, and yet he could be quite dispassionate about the whole thing, and if you were talking about something else, then that was what was important. And, um, I mean, we were very close at one time, but it, it wasn't very long. <laughs> and uh, I think my husband sued him for alienation of affection, so that pleased my husband, but I don't, I don't suppose it worried Mickey at all. <laughs> Sister Cloda, Sister Cloda! Do you know what she says about you? Well, whatever she said, it was true. You said that because you love her! I don't love anyone! Cloda. 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 She was terrific, wasn't she? And, of course, today, when people see that film, and a lot of young people, of course, they haven't seen it before, and even today, they're still sort of shocked. Uh, it's one of the shocking scenes in the picture where she puts on red lipstick and she's going to leave the order. And they all talk of the horrible feeling they have, which is strange. 
I found it very interesting that happens, but it does happen. Of course, when she comes out of the door, intent to kill Deborah, uh, that's a horrific moment. It had a lot of uh, weird horror in it, didn't it? She comes out with this fantastic white face and murder in her eyes, and she comes towards uh, Deborah, and they have this fight, you know, and you see, you see this terrific depth. Well, in actual fact, the distance from where they were standing and fighting, from, the, from where they were, their feet were to the ground, was about six feet. <laughs> off the bell I did that oh I think about 12 or 14 times and it wasn't that terrible drop it's quite but um, I've seen a picture of me falling backwards off the bell with my skirt in the air and it's quite it's quite impressive I think I made a very good job of that <laughs> I think it was only when I saw the film that I realised I needn't have acted at all. <laughs> Jack was doing all the lighting. I mean, when I come out of that door, um, when I'm going to the bell to kill the world, to try and push her off it, um, the lighting was so marvellous. Both Alfred Junger and Jack Cardiff received Oscars at the 1947 Academy Awards. That is a great thing to have. I mean, some people say, oh, you... It's not everything to have an Oscar, but I think it is. It's, it's everything to have an Oscar, you know. It's, it's your, 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 your peers in the business have given you something, and that's what it all comes down to. But whilst the public loved it, a number of critics found the flamboyant expressionist style of the Archer's latest effort too much to take. The critics were always being caught sort of off balance, wondering exactly what the point of the films was. Uh, you, you find this in, in their responses to almost all their films of the 40s, you know, what, what's the film trying to say, what's it really about? And in the case of Black Narcissus, that seemed to be a relatively straightforward film, but there was a kind of sexual undercurrent that disturbed many people. I remember meeting um, a, a director from Hollywood who, who came over to England and wanted to see me, and I think I, I said, well, I don't really know how you see me. And he said, we see you as strictly neurotic, Miss Byron. <laughs> so if there were any neurotic parts, I was going to get them. The success of Black Narcissus allowed Powell and Pressburger more creative freedom than ever before. Their next film, The Red Shoes, would be a visually groundbreaking attempt to take ballet into the realm of pure cinema. After years of critical neglect, The Archers are now appreciated as one of the most important partnerships in film history. Black Narcissus was amongst their greatest achievements. We have to remember that this was the period, 1947, 48, this is the period when, uh, you know, rip-roaring melodrama is very much the kind of idiom, both for Hollywood cinema and for British cinema. This was a period of relatively unbridled emotion on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think if we see it in that light, Black Narcissus really isn't out of step with the times at all. In fact, what it does is offer rather a different take on the mainstream melodrama of the late 40s. But Powell and Pressburger always liked to be slightly out of the mainstream, doing something a bit different. Mm -hmm. 